Hello, this presentation speaker is Dr. Star Scott Tarnavieski. Very good. Better than me. Dr. Tarnavieski is a professor of history at Weatherford College and currently the chair of the Social Sciences Department. He has a BS in secondary education from Missouri State, sorry, Missouri Southern State University, an MA in history from Pittsburgh State University, and a PhD in history from the University of Arkansas. He has taught at a number of colleges and universities, and this is his ninth year at Wedford College. Okay. All right, I know, that was great. All right, um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, this topic, uh, The Sable Arm, which was a book, uh, uh, Revisited, The Historiographical Evolution of African American Participation in the Civil War. And for those of you who are going, what does historiographical mean? It is a fancy word that historians use about, this is the stuff that was written about, is the scholarship on the topic over the course of time and how it has changed. So that's, that's what I'm looking at, is the impact of this book uh, upon, uh, and what it does, because it was a groundbreaking uh, work. Now, I, I'm looking out here and I see a lot of very young people. How old are you? 13. Okay, I gotta watch my language. How old are you? 16. 16. 17. 17. Mm. 25. <laughs> what? 21. Neither of you looks nearly that age. Yeah. You, I, if you had said you were 16, 18, I would not mention it. Yeah. All right, so we got some youngsters in here, and you're 17. 17. You're not 17 back there, I know. I'm 25. Um, what's that? 25. 25. Okay, all right. And Tom is, is, is 28. Um, <laughs> Remembers the Civil War uh, in his speeches. Okay. So, back when many of you were not even remotely close to being born, back in 1990, there was a, a very good movie that came out, a movie called Glory. Any of you ever watched Glory? All right, we got a few people that watched Glory back in 1990. I was 17 years old or so in 1990, and no, Tom, don't start doing the math about how old you were that particular time, uh, it will be disheartening. Uh, so, uh, so I, I went and watched this movie, and it was really great and inspiring. And this is when Denzel Washington got a start. This, he won Best Supporting Actor in this movie. No one really knew who Denzel Washington was before him. No one really knew who Morgan Freeman was before this movie. Now, everyone knew who Matthew Broderick was, because of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. But, uh, so this is a, a story about, and it's, it's, it's a relatively true story. I mean, they, they added some characters that weren't actually figures. And it's a story of, of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry, which was an African-American regiment in the American Civil War. And uh, one of the key characters and the leading character in this particular story is, is Matthew Broderick's uh, character right here, uh, Robert Gould Shaw, who was an abolitionist young man from Massachusetts who became the colonel of this particular regiment and had to, it had to transform them from uh, what they were, which was just everyday people, uh, into, into soldiers, and then try to get them uh, to be respected by the white, uh, larger white population, white army of the Potomac and other troops in the area. And I watched it, and I went, there were black soldiers in the Civil War? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. You know, no one talked about it. It wasn't really a big talking book. I, and by 17, I was reading lots of books on the Civil War. I was devouring them. And again and again, there was really no, hardly any mention of this. I certainly hadn't paid attention to it. Uh, and, and, and by the way, in this particular scene here is this culminating uh, the climax of the movie at the very end. And I hate to break it to you, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, what happens there at the end, uh, there is this charge that needs to be made, an assault upon Fort Wagner or Battery Wagner just outside the entrance to Charleston Harbor. And the 54th Massachusetts volunteers to lead this very difficult, very desperate assault. Uh, and they do, and there's other regiments, and they're, they're defeated. They're driven back and suffer heavy casualties uh, in the process. But through that gallant charge, through that, they gained respect. They gain the respect from the white soldiers that African-American soldiers will fight. Because a lot of people didn't think they would, for a variety of reasons. 
But the question that, that I had afterwards is like, since when did black soldiers fight? And I was like, why didn't I know this? Why hadn't I read books about this? And, and that was back in 1990. And, uh, and so then I started, later on I was, I was, I was doing uh, various research and all of that sort of stuff. And, and I found out that really the, the research, the historiographical research, the, the study of black soldiers in the Civil War had only occurred about 30 years before, a little over that. In 1956, a book called The Same Alarm came out. It was first published. It was the first academic book with a bunch of, of sources, citations, talking and proving that African Americans did fight in the Civil War. And in fact, they did 180,000, almost, well, a minimum of 180,000 soldiers, African Americans, fought in the Union Army in the Civil War. Why is that a minimum? is there were quite a number of, of, of white officers, and these were white commanded regiments. African American men could not be officers, could not be uh, kept command. A few black men got commissions, but very, very few. And, and the issue is, and, and I think was, was why there, there might have been more, is there were white officers who when one of their, their black soldiers died, they just plugged in another guy, a slave off the field, into the ranks and just didn't bother reporting it because so there was probably in excess of 200,000, which is about 10% of the entire Union Army uh, by the end of the Civil War, about 2 million men. So what my, my, my focus here is on what, what was going on beforehand that was this ignorance on this topic of African American soldiers in the Civil War, and who was this person, what was this book that changed things, and was it in fact the book to change things. Now just to give you a bit of a background, uh, in 1860, this is, this is one year before the Civil War, in 1860, every 10 years the U.S. government is obligated, it's constitutionally required to do a census. You might be picking up a little hints right now here in 2020. This is the 10th year. Uh, every 10 years, this is the 10th year, we're getting ready to do another census. Okay, so when, you know, for your parents, when they, the government comes around and says we need this information, you might tell your parents not to assume that it's they're there to steal the guns or something like that. They're just, they're just trying to find out you know, what the population is. Uh, so, in 1860, the, the African American population in the United States of America, out of about 30, 32 million people, uh, was 4 million. Right around 4 million. And almost all of them were in the American South, and almost all of them were enslaved. In the South, there were 12 million people, one third of them, 4 million were enslaved people. So we have that, 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 that number, I think, that, that needs to be have put there. Now when the war breaks out, when, when, the, the, when Fort Sumter is fired upon, uh, Fort Sumter is fired upon by, by, the, by the Confederate troops in Charleston Harbor, in an unprovoked manner, this begins the American Civil War in, eight, in April of 1861. And does Abraham Lincoln, there's old young Abraham Lincoln, 1961, uh, does he call for African American soldiers? Does he say we need to recruit African Americans in the Army in 1861? Better you say no, right? You're right, no. There's reasons for this. Now, one of the reasons why Lincoln doesn't dare to do this, because if he does, is it going to anger some white Southerners? Definitely it's going to anger white Southerners, although they're generally pretty angry already. Um, but it's going to anger a lot of white northerners as well. And after Fort Sumter, the, the white north was, was united in anger upon this unprovoked attack upon American soldiers, an American fort, the American flag, by the Confederacy. It united the, the white north. Does Lincoln want to squander that unit? No, he's not going to risk squandering it. So he wants to maintain that unity because he needs it. Because a lot of those Northerners, they're not Republicans. They didn't vote for him. So he, he needs them to back him up right now. Beyond that, though, and perhaps even more importantly than that, is Lincoln does not want to anger the border states. Okay, you see the purple ones, Missouri, Kentucky. Don't bother about West Virginia. It, wasn't, it was part of Virginia back then. Uh, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. No one cared about Delaware. There were like, I don't know, three slaves in all of Delaware and 20 other people. Who cares? Um, 
But what he really cares about is not angering Missouri, in particular Kentucky and Maryland. These are slave states with substantial slave populations. And they have not seceded. But it's not that they won't secede. They're just waiting to see if Lincoln is going to do, is Lincoln going to do something against slavery or not? If he does, what will they most likely do? Secede. Making the North's effort at forcing the South back into the Union much, much more difficult. So he's not willing to, to, to risk that. And so he does nothing about slavery. He says this war has nothing to do with slavery. This is 1861. Now, as we move into 1862, the white North is becoming more and more like, we've got to do something about this. Not everyone, but enough of them that, you know, the South is utilizing their slave population to support their war effort in a variety of ways. They're building entrenchments, they're building forts, they're working on the fields back home, freeing up white labor to go and work uh, fighting in, in the army. So we've got to start going after this sort of thing. Lincoln himself is not real excited necessarily early on in 1862 to do anything about it. But in July of 1862, we have the passage of what was called the Second Confiscation Act and the Militia Act. These two acts, the Second Confiscation Act, uh, freed uh, slaves owned by slave owners who were in open rebellion against, uh, against the United States. And basically, in other words, if you were a, uh, a Confederate officer or a Confederate civilian, that was, let's say, in one way, actively supporting the Confederacy. You were in the army, you were in the government, something along those lines. Your slaves were fair game. Now, they're, they're, they're freed, but of course, are they actually freed? That's like me saying, your money is mine. Is it really mine? How, how, is that, how do I make my money, your money mine? By taking it, right? So as long as it's in your pocket, it's, it's still yours, right? So the, South, the Union has, the North has to go and enforce this. The Militia Act allows for recruitment of African Americans, either as soldiers or as manual labor, run, you know, doing things, running wagons, whatever the, the case might be. A lot of African Americans were actually employed by the US military in a variety of jobs beyond soldiering in the Civil War. At the same time, basically at the same time, uh, the War Department issued General Order Number 143, which created what was called the Bureau of Colored Troops to recruit African Americans in the U.S. Army. And they began to actively go around the country, excluding certain states like Kentucky, um, recruiting African Americans, which easily could be, if you were a slave, you were an enslaved person, and there was a recruiter from the Union Army, what could you do? You could flee the field, flee the farm, join the Union Army, and guess what? You're, you're free. You know, they're not going to send you back. Well, it's not supposed to send you back. So, so this begins the, 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 the recruitment of African Americans. Uh, they, are, they are not paid the same amount as white soldiers, even though they're risking as much, if not more. Uh, they only paid ten dollars a month instead of fifteen dollars a month, and actually three dollars of that ten dollars was, was taken away from them automatically uh, to pay for the uniforms, which is really a, a hard pill to swallow for the African American soldiers. White officers only would command these black-only regiments. They were, for the most part, generally distrusted and disliked by the white soldiers. They were distrusted and disliked by the generals. William T. Sherman had absolutely no use. Sherman was a raving racist. And he had no use for these, these black soldiers. He only used them normally for garrisoning uh, stuff way in the back. He didn't want them, he didn't want them up front with, his, with, with, the, with the, the field armies marching further and further into the Confederacy. Uh, the Confederate government refused to recognize African Americans as soldiers. They threatened to enslave them. Uh, and it, when captured, Lincoln basically said, if you do that, you were going to enslave some of your white some of your Confederate soldiers. And they backed off and they put him in, they put him in prisons. Um, but they wouldn't exchange him, which broke down the whole uh, 
exchange, prisoner exchange system. Uh, intend to get these Confederate prisoners, prisons overloaded with, with Union soldiers. Um, but oftentimes, most African American soldiers, when captured, were just straight up killed by the soldiers themselves. And there were instances of massacres, uh, the Fort Pillow Massacre uh, under the command of Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, the uh, massacre that occurred during and after the Battle of the Crater under the command of Robert E. Lee. Uh, these uh, occurred. And, uh, that's what it was. By the end of the war, some 70,000 African American soldiers had died, overwhelmingly from disease, only about 2,000 from battle. Uh, but 70,000 out of roughly 200,000 is a pretty significant number. That's certainly higher than the losses by white soldiers. So then the question is, is well, how, how, do we, how do we know all about this? How do we know? Well, we know this because of a guy named Dudley Taylor Cornish, right there, that guy. Now, it wasn't until 1956 that the American people were reacquainted with all of this information. Between 1865 and 1956, to a great degree, this is entirely true, but to an awful lot, of, of Americans, they had no idea that African American soldiers actually fought for their freedom in the American Civil War. Had no idea. There was almost no scholarship on it. it certainly was not generally known amongst most uh, uh, histor American historians by the early to mid 20th century. And certainly wasn't known uh, by, uh, by a lot of Civil War historians. It was shocking. Now there's reasons for this. Though this forgetting was intentional by the United States, North and South. Now, the White South, after the Civil War, quickly began to create a, a false narrative of the entire Civil War. Why they seceded, uh, suddenly it wasn't about slavery, even though that's what they said, it suddenly was about states' rights. Uh, and suddenly they knew from the beginning that they couldn't win the war, even though they said they were certainly were gonna win the war back in 1861. Uh, all of these things are what's called the lost cause mythology that was invented uh, in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, and became across the board, North and South, basically accepted as, as, as fact. Uh, if, if you really think that Gone with the Wind is like a factually, factual representation of American history, you're embracing lost cause mythology. And it's very popular, it's deep rooted in the United States, North and South, a lot of people just don't want to give it up. We're not here to discuss that, that particular issue. But as a result, white Southerners and white Northerners wanted to give no credit to this, to, to African Americans. First of all, white Americans, for the most part, embraced the idea that the war had nothing to do with slavery. Let's, let's take out that icky race thing out of our, our glorious memory. It was about states' rights. And remember that white Northerners are just as racist as white Southerners towards African Americans. So the idea of discrediting any contributions of African Americans is widely embraced. No credit should be given to African Americans for anything. For example, an early, a, a, a leading early 20th century historian uh, wrote this about African Americans during the Civil War. The American Negroes, this is about the 1920s, the American Negroes are the only people in the history of the world, so far as I know, that ever became free without any effort of their own. The Civil War was not their business. They had not started the war nor ended it. They instead twanged, banj 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 twanged banjos around the railroad stations sang melodious spirituals, and believed that some Yankee soldier would come along and give each of them 40 acres of land and a mule. That was the commonly held perception, that the African Americans were just sitting around waiting for white Yankees to come along and free them, and then give them land. And that is, that's a, a completely incorrect point of view. It's historically inaccurate but still to this day entrenched in American society to a certain degree, this, this, this attitude. So, and that's the case. This is, this is what 
If historians are thinking this and believing this, these are the people who write the textbooks that go into history classes in high school, middle school, and elementary, which means that becomes the history for the American people. It's not until 1956 that this young man, Dudley Taylor Cornish, breaks that myth. Dudley Taylor Cornish was a, had been a veteran and he fought in World War II. He was a military policeman. After the war, using the GI Bill, he ultimately earned a PhD uh, from the University of Colorado, Boulder. And he wrote, wrote a dissertation on this very topic of African American soldiers and the Civil War. And he, he, he didn't know anything about it. And suddenly, he's going to the National Archives and elsewhere, and there's tons of stuff, enormous amounts of information that no one has looked at in almost a hundred years. Just sitting there for some historian to come along and discover and go, oh yeah, that. 10% of the American, the American army was actually African American soldiers. Yeah, we kind of forgot about that one. It was, it was, and he ultimately, he, he turns that dissertation into a book titled The Sable Arm. Now initially in 1956, it was The Sable Arm, Negro Troops and the Union Army because the word Negro was commonly used. In the, in the United States, not until really the 1960s that that term becomes seen as, as, as a term of the past, of racism, and the African-American population of the United States decides that they don't want to be referred to or known as Negroes. Instead, it switches to the word black until in the late, in the 1980s, they start switching over to African-Americans. Uh, so, and this particular book right here, this edition was published in the 1980s. And I think still to this day, if you buy a, a copy of this, it's still going to look like this. Uh, the Sable Arm, Black Troops of the Union Army, 1861 to 1865. So here he is. He writes this book, and he studies the exam. He studies and examines how the process of African Americans, African Americans, first of all, are not allowed to be soldiers how they become soldiers, how they're treated as soldiers, and how they perform. That's what he's looking for. And so he convincingly, with massive amounts of irrefutable scholarship, proved that African Americans, in fact, fought in the Civil War. They did not sit around twanging banjos, banjos waiting for someone to free them. Uh, instead, they stepped up. And at great personal risk, because these African, almost all of the African Americans who fought in the Civil War were slaves. They came, they freed themselves by leaving the fields, leaving the farms and plantations, and joining the Union Army. Which means, if they get caught, what's going to most likely happen to them? One of two things. Either they might be re-enslaved, or more likely, they're going to be killed which frequently happened if they were captured. So this was, this was more than just, they weren't simply fighting for the preservation of the Union, they were truly fighting for the freedom of themselves and their families, their loved ones, everyone they knew. This, was, this meant a great deal to them. This work proved groundbreaking and opened up a field of study in the Civil War that had largely been forgotten or at least ignored for nearly 100 years. When the work first came out, reviews were very positive, leading historians like George B. Tyndall, and if you're a historian, you know that Tyndall is like a, a big, big time, big name historian for the 20th century. Uh, Tyndall wrote that the Sable Arm was, quote, volume, a volume of permanent value in superior craftsmanship. And again and again, this book was recognized with terms like that in book review after book review, because it was filling this, this huge need, this gap in the understanding of the American Civil War. And the impact of the book was completely clear. Leading historians in African American history, like the late great Willard Great the Gatewood, who was a very uh, subsidy historian on African Americans in the late 19th century and early 20th, uh, uh, said it marked a watershed in the historiography of the black military experience and that Dudley Taylor Cornish became an early and important participant in the revolution of black 
historical studies. The leading Civil War historian and Pulitzer Prize winner, James McPherson, if any of you have ever read uh, Battle Cry of Freedom, that's James McPherson's book, the Pulitzer Prize winner. But when, and he, he actually, back in the 1960s, he wrote a dissertation and ultimately became a book on African Americans in the Civil War. It's called The Negroes' uh, Civil War. Uh, he wrote about how that book impacted him. Uh, I probably read the book first in 1960 or 61. Uh, I have gone back to it many times, for it serves as a useful reference event. Uh, I have subsequently read many other works on black troops and have written some about them myself, but Cornish's book is the foundation of that. Uh, Joseph T. Glather, who became probably in the, in the late 19th, early 20th century, probably unquestionably the leading historian of African Americans in the Civil War, and he wrote a book called Forged in Battle, The Civil War Alliance of Black Soldiers and White Officers, when asked about the influence of the Sable Arm, responded that, quote, I could never have written Forged in Battle without the Sable Arm. By providing the detailed overview of the black military experience, I was able to delve into all sorts of areas, such as personal experiences, racism, attitudes. And of course, his research served as a starting point for my own research. In short, without the Sable Arm, Forged in Battle would not have been possible. So in other words, and this is something that historians pay a great deal of attention to, is what is the book? What is the historian who shapes the narrative on a topic? Now oftentimes in history, this is what we call historiography, over the course of time, another book comes along and reshapes the narrative, changes the narrative. Normally it happens every 20 or 30 years. But still to this day, the narrative has not changed. What Dudley T. Cornish discovered and wrote about and extensively cited in the Sable Arm is the bedrock for all knowledge on African American soldiers in the Civil War. So if you pick up your textbook, and what high school are you at Springtown? You're in Idaho? Uh, who? Any, any high school or high school? Public school, high schools? Oh, you're, you're in middle school, sorry. What's your middle school? Oh, you're a homeschooler. All right. What about you two? Homeschooler. Homeschooler. All right. So your textbook that your parents had, and you had probably something like a textbook, right? Um, whatever that is, and oftentimes in textbooks there, there's like a suggested readings list at the end of the chapter. Uh, if you look at those books, there's almost certainly on the Civil War there's going to be a book talking about African-American soldiers in the Civil War. At this point, it probably won't be Dudley Taylor Carnage because it's too far back. But if you start looking at that, that book's bibliography and their end notes, guess who's going to come up time and time again? Dudley T. Cornish. Because what they know and understand about the Civil War, which shaped how they understood African American soldiers' contributions to the war, is in turn shaped by the work of Cornish in the same war. And so that's true still to this day. So when you watch a movie like Glory, I mean, watch Glory. It's a really good movie. It's a, it'll get you pumped up if you haven't seen it by the end. You know, and then you'll be just shocked. You'll almost be in tears at the very, very tail end of it when you realize they didn't win. And what happens to those soldiers and to Robert Lynch. That book, that movie, that Academy Award winning movie is in turn influenced by Dudley T. Cornish. It's based upon it. Without him, there is no glory. Okay? That's my discussion. Thank you. Do you all have any questions? That's, that's a monument to the 54th message. There is no glory. That was a little bit. Any questions at all? I know that's kind of a, Yes, sir. How did the white officers feel about commanding uh, all black? Units. Uh, it depended it on, on, on the officers. Some of them saw this as just an opportunity for advancement, promotion, uh, because it wasn't eagerly sought. Uh, you, you were not, you really weren't going to be assigned to be a commander of, of a black only regiment. Uh, so normally it was either going to be someone who was more abolitionist oriented, or it was going to be someone who was just looking for a promotion, a better paycheck, something like that. Um, some of them uh, were. So treated their sol the soldiers very well, trained them, protected them, did what they could. Others 
uh, they just they allowed them to be used as essentially manual labor. Uh, so it depended upon it. But for the so you, you kind of had two different groups of, of people who chose to be an officer in, in the black-only regiment. All right, thank you. Yeah. How did the slave owners allow the recruiters to come in and get the slaves? Uh, they didn't. <laughs> it, it, they, they, these people left. Uh, they they actually walked off the fields. They they, they left uh, and abandoned the farm. So they, 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 they were selling kids well, on finding runaways. By, by this point in time, the certainly, for example, the, the, the two biggest states that contributed to African Americans in the Civil War were Louisiana and Kentucky. Louisiana became an occupied, uh, became invaded by the Union Army. And what happens is, first of all, the Confederates' ability for civil control starts to break down. But if you're an African American and you know that 30 miles away or 60 miles away is freedom, it's not so hard because we're all, all the able-bodied men. Well, they're in the Confederate Army for the most part. So the ability to stop the fleeing uh, was very hard. Kentucky, of course, never secedes. It's not until 1864, I think, that, that they're finally allowed to do recruiting in Kentucky as well. And again and again, it was not that the slave owners allowed this to happen. One of the very funny things and shocking things about slave owners, uh, and if you read letters and diaries about slave owners during the Civil War, is they feel at their anger and sense of betrayal toward their, their slaves who run away. In the They're like, how dare they? After all the things I've done for them. They were really upset. You know, they, they, they really thought that, that, that these guys were like really happy to be slaves. Like, didn't they really recognize they took care of them? Oh yeah, well you beat them and raped them and sold their children away. Yeah, I'm sure they appreciated it a whole lot. Um, so, now they, they gained their freedom by, by, by using their feet. And when the Union Army was then took over an area, the recruiters could just come right through. And, and they, it was not unusual for African American enslaved people to do. I'm not staying here. And oftentimes they were allowed to work, their, their, their families would go with them. And they get them. They were oftentimes sort of like refugee camps for for African escape, runaway families in some locations. Anything else? Um, you said that all books or most textbooks for schools were influenced by that one guy. Well, as far as the, that topic, as far as within, the topic. within uh, so the topic on the chapter on the Civil War, you will have a section or a few sections. Maybe a page that might deal with that particular topic of African Americans and the Civil War, and the no. underpinnings for what they write about in there is the Cornish scholarship. African Americans' role in the Civil War? Yes. Oh, okay. So don't you think that's a bit troublesome for historical accuracy? What do you mean? Like, just it's all influence off one base. Like, I don't know. I'm not sure. Is. I'm not understanding what you're asking. If it's coming from one source, mm -hmm. if the story, let's yeah. say, is coming from one source, don't mm -hmm. you think it's troublesome that for historical accuracy that it's not going to be like that? It might might not be good. Yeah, it might not. Yeah, be well, that's that's right. the thing is other historians that they they dig into into those sources themselves because okay. what happens this this is what if, if you're in my, one of my classes and you you're going to write a research paper for me like my Western Civ one or Western Civ two, okay? Yeah. Uh, the easiest way to get so, figure out what sources you're going to find for your topic is not to go find it yourself. It's to go find a book or a journal article that's really good on that topic, and you go to the bibliography. You, where do they get their stuff? Because why reinvent the wheel? Someone else already did all the research for you. And so then you look at that stuff. Now, you're, you're going to most likely be using secondary sources. But for historians, what we do is we go, okay, where do they get this stuff? Now I'm going to go and look at those primary sources. And sometimes that allows for a reinterpretation of the sources. The sources are the sources. Unless there's something new discovered. And by this point in time, typically you're not going to find much new. I mean, you'll find a, a diary here or some letters here. But otherwise, we know what happened. And so no one has been able to come along and go, you know what, his, his research is is weak. Now, does that mean he doesn't look at some things that later historians look at? Yeah, that, that certainly is. He doesn't look at African American sailors, which, while soldiers weren't allowed to fight in the Civil War, African Americans could, could be in the U.S. Navy much earlier. You know? And that was largely because it was like, well, they're on ships. You don't, you don't have to see them. 
you have to think about it, that sort of thing. Uh, Joseph Lathar's focus was on that relationship between officers and, and, and soldiers, the question that you were asking, and, and what sort of attitudes did, did they have toward their soldiers, that sort of thing. So what it, what it is, is, is this, this bedrock that everyone has, they, they start there, they use his sources to begin their research. Oh. And if there was problems, we, by, after 70 years, they would have found there were 70 problems. Okay? Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Hope you're enjoying the time.